And we've been at church, folks. Thankful for God and what he's doing. Thankful for your obedience uh, to follow after him and pursue him. Um, real quickly, I don't know if uh, Coach Boyd is here this morning. I, don't, I can't see if he's out there. Um, would, so we've got some represent, representatives here of uh, Moore Middle School basketball. So if you go to Moore Middle School and you're on the basketball team, will you stand up? All right. All right, thank you, bud. We just want to celebrate them and, and Coach Boyd for all the things that he's doing there at Moore and uh, excited about what God has for their season coming up. We just want to say thank you for being here, bud. A um, couple other things I want to make you aware of. If um, When you came in, I don't know if you received one of these little slips of paper or not, but this is our next steps. And um, if you are a regular tender here at Farmdale, this is the first time you've heard of this or seen this, possibly. But like everything that's been said this morning, Jesus has come. He's died. He was uh, resurrected on the third day. He went back to the Father. He's coming again for a purpose. Amen. And we believe that wholeheartedly. We don't just say it. We actually want to live by it. And we're thankful that he has called us into his mission um, for this world. And so we take that seriously here at, at Farmdale. Um, one of the ways that we do this is to partnering with you on your journey with Jesus. And so like our mission and our vision is to take Jesus to the community one person at a time. Um, we also want to partner with you as you take that next step with your walk with the Lord. And so um, we have basically five different steps that will assist you on your journey with Jesus. And I just want to mention those um, really quickly this morning um, so that you're familiar with them. You'll be hearing about them more as the weeks uh, come by. But our first step is our family dinner. This is an opportunity for you that if you're new at Farmdale to come have a free meal and get to know the leadership and the staff um, of Farmdale, get a little bit uh, more information on who we are and uh, just get to know you a little bit better. Um, number two is we have service opportunities that you can be a part of right now that the church is participating in whether it's Beside You for Life, which is a crisis pregnancy center, our overflow ministries that reaches out to uh, a lot of the homeless and, and people that need food. There's ministries that you can jump in and be a part of um, here at Farmdale that we want you to, uh, to know about. And number three is what we call exploring the scriptures. We care deeply about you being confident and able to understand the Bible, to be able and equipped to open it up, to read it, and to understand what it's saying, I can't, I'll never forget the very first time, you know, that I started to actually study the scripture, I felt a little lost. And so we are passionate about not assisting you and being able to open God's word and get to know it and feel confident in it as you study it. And then four is baptism. I'll just tell you, the Lord is working here at Farmdale. In the last six months, we've baptized 35 people. And so God is working and we're so thankful for what he's doing. Uh, baptism is a way for you to publicly declare that you're with Jesus. It, it's, it represents your old life going down with Christ in the grave and in the dirt and your new life as he was resurrected coming up that you are identifying and professing your commitment to him. And so that is a step in your journey. And then lastly is membership um, to come and be a part of the body and covenant together um, in this work that we do. So those are the next steps. You'll be hearing a little bit more about that. Um, and then like Pastor Teo said, we have a Hispanic service that meets here at 6 p.m. in the evenings in the activity center. And so if, if you're looking for a Spanish-speaking church, if you know someone that needs a Spanish-speaking church, we want to invite you here 6 p.m. in the evening, Pastor Teo, as he leads uh, the gospel there. And so just thankful for everything that the Lord is doing here. Amen. All right. Housekeeping items over. Let's get to it. So if you got your Bible, go ahead and open up with me. Um, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And as we jump in, um, we're going to be working through this chapter, but we're also going to be getting into 12. My prayer for you and for me is that we'll hear from the Lord. 
And so uh, let's grab our Bibles. We got the screen, the uh, scriptures on the screen as well, but let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Jesus, we're blessed. Oh my goodness, we're blessed. And so, Father, I just pray that your word would open up our eyes, that we would hear from you as you have spoken in the Old Testament and New Testament. You're still speaking even today to us through your word. And so, God, as we sit under it this morning, I pray that our hearts are changed. Our hearts are changed. There's no other reason why, Lord, to be here other than to celebrate you and to conform ourselves to your likeness more and more every day. So, God, I pray you do this work in us, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, This is a safe place, as you'll see. So I'll just tell you, in 2020, my family, we do this like family vacation every other year. And so we get together as a family. Well, in 2020, we had planned for over a year to go to Disney World. And like I said, this is a safe place. I would rather you send me into a big hay field, leave me for dead, than send me to Disney World. Amen. I just literally... My wife's not in here this morning, so I can talk freely again. <laughs> that I just hate Disney World. Like, I don't know what it is, the walking, you know, the, the rides, the, the animals that are walking around everywhere. Like, my boys loved it. Other people loved it. But, like, that's what we were planning to go to. And as we are planning to go to, I'm like, oh, man, you know, I'm sort of just giving in, right? I'm sacrificing my own desires for my family, right? Praise me. And, uh, and, and so I'm doing this. And then my wife, she's like, you know what? We're going to these. Well, we need t-shirts. I'm like, t-shirts. I'm like, I got a lot of clothes in there. And then she's like, no, like we all need to match. We need to have like matching t-shirts. I was like, we are not going to be those people. Please. Like, I don't want to do this. I don't like, and so she just is very persistent. And so I, so, I, I sort of gave in and was just like, you know what, okay, we'll do the t-shirt. I gave a little. And then literally, probably a week or two later, she now has plans for matching shirts every day of the week. And I'm like, dang, gone. Like, what in the world did I do? And so I'm sitting there, and, it's like, and I just gave in. But that is the reality of what we're seeing here. When we compromise... And we continue to compromise and give a little and give a little. We open the door for foolishness in our life. We do. We see that. We open the door for foolishness. And I say that jokingly, but as we look at this story of David, we're going to see him sort of compromise. And what happened? Foolishness happens. And so let's go ahead and jump into our passage this morning. David in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, but King David is the king of Israel, and it says this, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness, And then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. We see just so clearly, I just want to highlight something I believe is very important about this passage. It says, in the springtime of the year, when kings go out to battle, what's David doing? He remained in Jerusalem. And this time frame is around springtime, it was a time when weather was good, It was sort of uh, formidable for war, and the kings would lead their armies out into battle, and this could last for a period of time just based on the military campaign, whatever that might be. And so 
this responsibility of the kings, and David's like, no, you know, I'm going to stay back and chill here in Jerusalem. I'm going to hang out in Jerusalem. And so he immediately again compromises his responsibility for comfort. And I say comfort because it says that this. It happened that late one afternoon, now listen, David was on his couch in the afternoon. Now, there's nothing wrong with being on your couch in the afternoon, but I mean like, okay, like it's giving this picture that my man is like, no, y'all go do that. I'm going to stay here and chill at the house, and I'm just going to sit around all day and do nothing. And so this is where he is. This is, this is the scene that it sets for us. And as David sort of compromises uh, his responsibility for his comfort, we see what happened. Foolishness happened. He's messing around on the roof, and he sees this woman who's beautiful, and he takes her, and ultimately she becomes pregnant with his child. What compromise is in our life? And I'll just tell you this. What the definition of compromise, this is my definition, is making room and making space for your idols. That's what compromise is. It's creating space for the things that you want most in your life that is not God. And as we see in this story, this leads to a devastating place. But so many times we do this, we make adjustments because we want something so deeply, we're pursuing something so deeply and fiercely and hard, we will do whatever we have to to make space for that thing. You can fill in the blank. David wanted comfort. And so he maneuvered his life in a way that he could just stay back while everyone else is doing things. And as he's doing that and making way for what he wants, he's welcoming disaster from all ends. Let's continue to read in the story in chapter 11, verse 8 through 9. So David, then um, he realizes what he's done. He has a baby mom now. And he says he sends a letter to Joab and told Joab, hey, why don't you send Uriah back? Send Uriah home. Um, We want him to come back. And so Uriah comes back, and David says to Uriah, he says, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But listen to what Uriah did. Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So do you see sort of this sinister plan starting to take fold? David said, bring Uriah back, right? His wife's pregnant. I'm the one that did that, so I, now I need to fix this. And so he, he really begins to try to fix this issue, and how he fixes this issue is he thinks, well, if Uriah can come back, you know, there's a lot of days in between. No one's really going to be able to pinpoint when she actually got pregnant. And so if he'll come back, then he can stay with her. He can lay with her. You know, all's good. So Uriah comes back, but notice Uriah sleeps at the door. And Uriah, when David asked him, why didn't you go down to your wife's house? Uriah says, hey, listen, Israel's out there fighting. The ark's out there. They're in booths. They're in tents. And and all of Israel is out there fighting. And I'm not going to go down to my house. I'm going to be loyal to my men, to 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 the military, and to you, king. And I'm going to stay right here at the door. His loyalty just begins to show. And this puts David sort of in a tailspin, as we're going to see in verse 13. And then it says this, then David goes a step further. And it says, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So David's plan now is like, he ain't going to his house now, but I know if I can get him drunk, he ain't, he's not going to be in control. So I want to get him drunk so he can't have control of himself, and then he'll go to his wife. <laughs> you see just the plot like thicken, and it's getting darker. But what does Uriah do? He sleeps on the couch of his servants. He's not going down to his wife. 
but he sleeps on the couch of his servants. And he continues on in verse 14 through 15. And it says this, In the morning, when he woke up, and he realized that he didn't go to his house, it says, In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. It says, In the letter he wrote this, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. So now his plan is like at full, at the height of its darkest level. The darkest form of this plan. He's like, I got to get rid of him. So if this isn't going to work, the only thing that I can do then is I have to kill him. So send him out, pull back, and let him be struck down. That was the plan. He had created such a dark plan to protect his one sin that he, cre- that he created. The one thing that he did, he formulated and plotted and manipulated. And, and sometimes we look at this story and we sort of we disassociate ourselves. We're like, man, I would never do that. But the problem is, no, maybe you might not have done something like that. There's a potential that you could do something like that. And the fact that you haven't done something like that, you should see as pure grace. Grace from Jesus that you haven't. But we disassociate ourselves from the story all the time because, like, I wouldn't do that. But the problem with sin is, my goodness, church, it's deceptive. Like, it is deceptive. You would think that you wouldn't do something, but what happens is you tell that one little white lie, and what happens to that white, white lie? It grows. And not only does it grow, but then you start trying to protect yourself from it, and you're not even contemplating the ramifications of what you're doing because you're so invested in protecting yourself. You know, it's like, you know, when you're sneaking, and I'm not saying I do this, no judgment here. It's not, everybody's looking at me with like judgy eyes already. It's like when you're sneaking and eating some cereal when your wife ain't looking. She's like, where's the cereal? And you're like, I don't know where the cereal is, man. Those kids. And, it is, and you start there. What happens? Then you get caught and she calls you out. You're like, no, no, no. You just stick to the story. And you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Something as small as that literally can be so destructive and destroy us if we aren't careful. If we don't watch And not just watch, but if we don't have in our lives a joy that far and a greater love for what transcends our life that outweighs all the joys of any other sin, any other material possession, any other cons, any other identity, is it when we have that far above everything else, that's what sustains us. That's what helps us to repent quicker because we have something we know that's better than the thing that we're pursuing. Does that make sense? Like seeing Jesus is so much bigger than everything else. It sort of makes everything else compare, like just sort of get smaller and smaller and smaller in our lives. And so we see the height of David's plan, right? The darkest, darkest that we'll see. But guess what? If you read this passage, Uriah's loyalty is shining brighter and brighter. With every situation that happens, as David gets darker and darker and darker in his plot and his manipulation, Uriah's loyalty is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And this is the contrast even of sin. As sin increases in your life, the grace of God is seen in a bigger way. Now, this does not mean that we go about sinning, that we say, well, I want the grace of God to be seen, so I'm going to go ahead and just sin. But this is what is played out, and we can see this even in the gospel. And here's what I mean by that. You look at the story of Jesus as he's walking this life. He is a perfect individual, something you and I cannot be, absolutely perfect. 
And at the height of his ministry, the, the culmination of all he was doing, as his righteousness grew, the sin against him grew darker and darker and darker, ultimately, until he's sitting on the cross and the most heinous acts of murder against the most undeserving person happens. And so Jesus is crucified. And it's the most heinous acts anyone has ever even contemplated because it's against the most undeserving person. And we see elements of this all through the Old Testament and the New Testament. But let's continue on. So here's the story. Uriah is killed. He's gone. David's plan it comes to completion in a sense. And so word gets back to David from Joab. Hey, guess what? Uriah is dead. And when Uriah's wife Bathsheba hears about this, this is where we pick it up in 11 verse 26 and 27. It says, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, look who swoops in. David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. And he bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. He finally got what he wanted, and that was to be protected from his sin. He didn't necessarily want her as his wife, but now he did. Right? He, he's sort of putting the cap on at the, the end of his plan. He's securing it all. He's making sure this is watertight sealed. He had finally gotten everything that he had wanted, and he was protected. And you could imagine even that moment, probably the sense of relief that he got. Just pictures like, oh, man, like it's over. He's gone. Now I got her. Nobody, you know, not a lot of people probably know about this. It doesn't look like the way I want it to look. I'm I'm good. And just a sense of relief probably just comes over him. He's so blinded. He's so blinded by his own, his own pursuits, his own sin, that he can't even see maybe what's going on. And I say this because what we see happen next is Nathan, who was a prophet at the time, he prophesies against David. He comes to David. David's probably living in just some relief. It's good. We can just go on. Everything's kosher. We move on. But then what happens? Nathan comes to him, and Nathan's like, I know what you did. And it's not, he's not saying, I know what you did. He's like, God knows what you did. And I'm speaking on behalf of God, and he, he tells him a parable of a rich man and a poor man and how the rich man sort of took the lamb from the poor man because he didn't want to offer his own lamb to this sojourner that was coming along. And so he took the, the one and only lamb that the poor man had. And David was like absolutely furious, furious. Listen to what it says in chapter 12, verse 5 through 6. It says, when Nathan said this, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives and the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he's did this thing, because he's had no pity. Now, look at the, just the, the blatant deception that David's in. He has no clue that it's talking about him. In church, sometimes I get worried and concerned. Like when we hear stories like this, we think it's talking about someone else. Oh, I know someone like that. Oh, I know that person. Oh, yeah, they, that's not me. Or we don't even give a thought. They're like right now, like God is like directly speaking to us. And it's not someone else sitting to your left or to your right who is not here. He's speaking to you. And he's like, do you see? I know what you've done. And some of us have just sort of lived our lives in a way where we don't even sort of, maybe we would say that we're Christians, 
Maybe we would say that we love God, or maybe we would say yes, and we go to church every now and then, we just sort of associate our, ourselves with Him, but we have literally got so lost in our own sin, we don't even know we're doing it. It's like a fish in water. You can't tell a fish he's in water. It's just his, it's his habitat. He doesn't know. And so we can get in this, this space where it's just like, we don't see that God is actually speaking to us right now this morning, Farmdale. He speaks to me. He speaks to you. He was so comfortable with his own sin, he didn't even think God was talking about him. What was that old song that said, you're so vain. You probably think this song is about you. But it's sort of opposite. It's like we're, sometimes we're so lost in sin, we don't see that God's talking about us. We're David in that sense. Like, that, that's us. He was so comfortable with it. His anger was kindled, and he could not make the connection that he was talking about him. So how does David respond? David responds this way. If you look down in verse 13 of chapter 12, David said to Nathan, this is so powerful. I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. What did David say in response to this? You're not talking about, who are you talking about? When, when, when Nathan said, you're the man I'm talking about, because that's what he said to him. He said, you're the guy. That's what this parable is about. Literally blatantly said, it's you that I'm talking about. David did not say, oh, what are you talking about? He didn't defend himself. He didn't try to justify his actions. He was caught in his sin, and he was so blinded, he didn't, reality was just completely twisted around. And as Nathan said, you're the guy, his response to him was not deflection. It wasn't blame shifting. It was, I have sinned against the Lord. Church, our response should always be as God reveals to us where we are and as he reveals to us areas in our life that he wants to take and shape and conform, areas in our life that he wants to shave off and chisel out and train us, it's not to say, who are you talking about? That ain't me. That's someone else. But when we hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit, our response is, I've sinned against you. It's a response of humility. It's a response of a contrite heart. And David actually wrote Psalm 51 in response to this. This was sort of his rep repentant psalm. I just want to look at this. this was not, I don't have the scripture on the screen, but I just want to look at this really quickly because I think it's important what we see in here. Psalm 51. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. This is David. He's actually writing this psalm, and it's the psalm of his repentance. And he says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. He said, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. And he continues on into verse 10, and he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He keeps going, but the, the point that I want to make from this is what did David say? He said what? Forgive me for my sins? No. He didn't say forgive me. He was repentant. He said, fix me. He did not say, forgive me for my sin against Bathsheba. And I think, church, sometimes we got to stop asking for forgiveness and start repenting. we got to stop saying, God, forgive me of this. God, forgive me of that. And say, God, fix my broken heart. God, I don't, I'm not trying to do this. Forgive me. We need to stop with the forgiveness and have a broken heart and repentance. Repentance is not asking for forgiveness. It's not merely confessing your sin. Forgiveness is thinking differently about your sin. It's a heart that understands who your sin is against. David did not say this. He did not say, I sinned against Uriah. 
Isn't that striking? He didn't say, I sinned against Uriah's family. I sinned against Bathsheba. Forgive me for hurting all those people. I mean, the wake of pain that he created and so many people's lives from that issue. He does not ask for forgiveness for those people. He said, I have sinned against the creator of the universe. Why? Like, why does he go there? Right? He goes there because it matters who you sin against. Church, you've heard me say this to you again. I'm going to say it again. It matters who you sin against. If I sin against you, I'm not going to catch much flack. If I sin against my wife, I'm going to catch a little more flack. If I sin against the president of the United States, I could face capital punishment, treason. I could be put to death because of that offense. How much more the creator of the universe? And sometimes we ask the questions like, how can God punish people? Like, it matters who you sin against. And David acknowledges this. I think we've gotten into this mode and this flow. Sometimes it's like, if I just confess it, if I acknowledge it, which is good and right to do, if I confess it, acknowledge it, and I say, just forgive me for it. Like, I can't tell you how many times I asked for forgiveness and God never forgave me. I'm telling you, I've... Asked for forgiveness so many times, and God never forgave me of my sin. It wasn't until my heart was repentant. It wasn't anymore about who I committed the sin against and the effects of the sin or being caught in my sin. It's when I had a different position towards my sin. It's like I I realized the, the messed up nature of my heart. I'm like, God, fix me. Like, I'm tired of all this stuff, this cycle and cycle of suffering and, and pain and sin and forgiveness. And I, it's like, fix me. Make me think differently about what I do. Church, this is what repentance is. It's not just saying, forgive me. It's saying, fix me. Clean me. Wash me. Do this in me. And I think that matters Because this is what David said. He said, I sinned against the Lord. Now notice the response of God. How quickly did he forgive him? I mean, this is astonishing. Right? They spent two chapters talking about David's sin. Two whole chapters. Talking about the sins of David. And then chapter 12 continues on about the consequences from David's sin that he still has to face. And there's literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words. The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. That quickly does God forgive. That quickly does he forget about your sin as far as it is from the east to the west Because he knows you're not just concerned about being caught in your sin and doing what's wrong. He knows that you have a heart for him and and that you want a new heart. And just like this, just like that, he can forgive you. Just like that. He can forgive you. You say, how can he forgive you so quick? There is a a passage in Romans 3.23 where... I think it answers this question. It's like, how does he forgive it so quickly? Like all of this sin, all of these things, uh, I'll tell you, the reason he forgives it so quickly is because he has a plan to make restitution. He had a plan of redemption. He had a plan for David's, David's redemption. From the very beginning, it says in Romans 3, 23 through 26, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, meaning counted as right, excuse me, by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a propitiation, which means a sacrifice, by his blood to be received by your, your belief, your faith. This was to show God's righteousness, show God's goodness, show God's justice, um, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Like, This is how all of the people of the Old Testament get to heaven. It's not because they believed in the resurrected Jesus. 
It's because they believed God with the information they had and they knew at the present time. And God being gracious and and patient with them, He passed over their sin because at the present time, at the perfect time, at the right time, He's going to make restitution for it. So He forgives quickly because He knows He's paying for it. He forgives quickly because He had a plan. And that plan came at His timing. So many times in our life, we wonder, like, why we go through stuff and why stuff happens and why do I have to go through this? And all of a sudden, what happens? We have those moments as Christians, we have those moments that God shows up, boom, right then. What? And you're so thankful. God's timing is perfect. And here he goes over and he passes over the former sins to show. This was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be a just God and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus Christ. So God had a plan for David's sin. God had a plan for all of his Old Testament fathers. God has a plan for your present sin today, even right now. The gospel was sufficient for last year's sin, 2000 BC sin, present day sin, and future sin. The gospel's sufficient all across the board. And Jesus bought, he brought a blow to the sin that the Satan has allowed and has propagated throughout history. He destroyed the penalty of sin. He destroyed the power of sin. And he's coming back again, church, and he's going to destroy the presence of sin. So my hope for us this morning is that you will have a repentant heart. I'm going to ask our praise team if they will come this morning as we close. My hope is that we all, myself included, would either continue in a position and a heart posture that says, God, you know more than me, God, you're greater than me. God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I desire you. And that we live in that with a heart that says, whenever you convict me, whenever you speak to me, whenever you share something with me where I'm off, I'm going to say, fix me, clean me, create in me a new heart. I'm not going to deflect and blame shift. But we will be a people with repentant hearts. And maybe you're here this morning and this, you just, this is just not your reality. That you're here this morning, and, and everything that I said, you know that, that God is speaking directly to you. Like directly to you. My desire for you this morning is that you will understand God forgives like that. That if you are thinking differently about your sin and you have, you desire a relationship with you, I'm not saying you've got it all figured out and you've got all the answers to all the problems. There's nobody that does that. I don't have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers but God. And he doesn't say, clean yourself up now, then come to me. You know, fix your problems, fix your sin, and come to me. We saw David. It's impossible to do that. My prayer for you this morning is that you would see the beauty and the goodness of God's grace, and you would say, I need it. I want it. That's my heart for you this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to pray for us. If the Lord is moving on you, if God is speaking to you, I want to give you the opportunity to come forward, to pray. You can come along these side pews. You can come up here to the chairs. Wherever you feel comfortable, I will encourage you to come. If you don't want to come and you're just going to sit there, sit there. My hope for you is that you will do business with God. He's here. And he's speaking to you. You're not here by accident. He desires and he wants a relationship with you. And so I'm going to pray for us. And as I'm praying, if you would just come and come and and kneel and sit and pray, whether you're, like I said, you're doing business with God for the first time or church, we're a people who need his spirit. We need repentant hearts.
Come do business with him this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Jesus, thank you for your words. Thank you for your truth. Father, we believe and know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God, that you're working and your presence is here. And Father, I know by your spirit, Lord, that you are convicting hearts. I know by your spirit, God, you're rearranging thought patterns. I know, God, by your spirit, you're breaking off chains that have held people bound and captive for so long. I know, God, that you're loosening the rope of bondage around people. So, Father, do your work. Do your work, Jesus. And, Lord, as we sing, God, about your goodness and we sing about your grace, I pray, Lord, that you would be lifted up, that you would be encouraged, that you would be I'm so overjoyed by our offering to you of contrite hearts. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We thank you and we praise you. For it's in your name and all God's people said, amen. You can still come forward as we sing.
Amen. Church, you are invited right after this morning's service um, back into our gym. We're having a family dinner. Lots of good food. Turkey, dressing, all the fixings and desserts. It's been prepared for you at no cost. We love you. We want you to come and eat with our family um, and be a part of Farmdale. And in that, may the God of all grace, may the God of all truth, may he bless you, may he keep you, may your hearts be so in love with him that your posture is always towards repentance this week and in the weeks to come. Love you guys. You're dismissed.